Good morning and welcome to this uh, panel discussion um, on managing funds in the post-COVID era. We've got a stellar panel today, this morning, uh, from different parts of the world, from New York, from Washington, from Bombay, Portugal. Uh, we're expecting uh, one of our uh, panelists to also join, Neeraj Bharatwaj, uh, shortly from Bombay again. Uh, actually from Delhi, sorry. Um, uh, and... Uh, I think I just kind of quickly set context um, um, in a couple of minutes, and then um, um, I'd kind of invite uh, the panelists to uh, share their perspective. We're at a very interesting and um, um, and perhaps in a uncharted territory as far as uh, investing is concerned from a global perspective. Um, we are obviously viewing this from an Indian lens, but. Um, Clearly, a lot of what is happening around the world, particularly in the U.S., is interesting for us to try and understand. Um, there are uh, talks of a very sharp recovery in the U.S., um, um, and there's also uh, the presidential elections looming large there. Um, um, and those, both of those issues will have a bearing on which way the fund flow you know, kind of from the U.S. to other parts of the world, especially in India, really pan out. Because one of the big themes that we we might touch upon is really around um, the decoupling from China, right, uh, which we spoke about uh, when we spoke to some of you uh, as well. Uh, and the kind of opportunities that it might throw up. Uh, is, it, is it for real? Is this really going to mean new opportunities from an Indian perspective? Um, or... Uh, are, is the Indian economy really likely to be roiled by the kind of pandemic and the, the national lockdown that we've, we've seen? So will the local economy really have the resilience and throw up new investment opportunities that, that can be in some ways uh, leveraged? And So uh, I think that's something that we will try and unpack. Uh, with the panelists, we'll also try and kind of really see what are the new investment themes that are opening up and how are they likely to play the game from from um, uh, both venture capital uh, uh, firms that are represented on this panel, the private equity, distressed assets, sovereign wealth funds who are likely to invest from from um, from from outside um, um, and um, try and kind of get a sense how that's likely to pan out. We're also going to try and towards the end take a uh, a slightly longer term view, maybe a year, because that's the best one can do, because every opportunity throws up, every crisis of this kind throws up new opportunities to try and see what um, is the uh, landscape that's likely to take shape in the next year or so, and what are the factors that might influence um, uh, how investing really will play out, especially from an Indian lens, right? So that's the territory that we're hoping to cover. So I will... Um, you know, uh, start by asking each of the panelists to spend maybe a couple of minutes giving us a feel and an introduction to what what's really going on with them, what they're seeing based on the conversations that they're having. Um, and I'd like to start with uh, Prakash, or you, uh, from your perch in Washington. Um, tell us a little about what you're seeing from your prism. Thank you so much, Indradeet, and nice to meet all of you, albeit virtually. Uh, I guess from an alternative investment, l let me zoom in first and then we'll zoom out. From an alternative investment industry perspective, that's the world in which I live, private equity and hedge funds. The, the trend that I think is shaping our markets and has for the last several years is really the trend with respect to sovereign wealth funds. And so... Uh, as David Rubenstein, the, the Carlisle leader, uh, has correctly said, in 2000, sovereign wealth funds probably represented a trillion dollars in our industry, whereas U.S. state pensions, like the CalPERS of the world, represented 10 trillion. And now, uh, fast forward 20 years, our assessment is that sovereign wealth funds, whether they be whether they be from the Middle East or from Asia, uh, or from Norway and Scandinavia, that this group of investors would likely represent $20 trillion in our business. And the U.S. state pensions, who were so dominant before, 
probably have downshifted due to the needs of their pensioners from some 10 trillion down to 5 trillion. So these are the marginal players in our capital markets. They're looking for returns and they are looking for returns through external managers and directly. Uh, and obviously in a, in a low interest rate world, such as the one we're now in and likely to be in for several years, uh, the emerging markets like India could, could be a place and we're already seeing it, uh, now where folks are more rather than less interested as, as time goes on. And then the, the other set of comments I would make when, whenever you think it's appropriate, but I don't want to distract from the panel, uh, relates to really virus, what I call virus economics and our election here. Uh, so from my perspective, the virus economic story is five R's, deep recession, reassessment, recovery, which may be more rapid than people were expecting, reinfection risk, which is what we're now starting to grapple with in parts of the United States, and then ultimately, and perhaps most importantly, re-election. So th those are the five R's that I, I think are likely to shape our markets and our, really our country for the, for the coming weeks. Thank you, uh, Prakash. Um, I'd like to also welcome Neeraj, who's uh, joined us now. Um, welcome, Neeraj, to the session. Thank you. Um, I'm going to kind of, um, we just started, Neeraj, talking about uh, the um, lay of the land and how that's kind of changed in the last uh, few months, especially with the pandemic and the lockdown and, and all that's happening around in the global economy as well. So I'll... Um, I think Prakash has just shared his perspective in the role of the sovereign wealth funds, as well as um, the, the looming uh, presidential elections and what impact that might have. Uh, we'll get into more depth, uh, Prakash, uh, but I'd like to first uh, move to Peter. Peter, from your prism, you're now currently in Portugal, um, if, if you're to understand. Tell us what, you, what you've experienced in the last few months. Just give us a quick sense. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, thank you, Indrajit. Um, it's a pleasure being here. So um, from our perspective, I think one of the first things that we need to consider is what phenomena are global and what phenomena are India specific. Um, obviously, in the fund landscape, um, funds, whether it's you know private equity or hedge funds, are here to generate alpha. And what does alpha generation actually mean in, in the India context? Um, you know, we all know that alpha is a zero sum game. So for some players to be, to be getting it, they're extracting it from someone, someone else. So to follow up on Prakash's point, um, insofar as pension funds or sovereign wealth funds are looking to India for alpha, um, the question is, are they able to get alpha? Um, or are they just getting a, the systematic return of Indian asset classes or the Indian market? Um, sure. In other words, are the managers delivering um, something um, skill-based and that's specific? Um, I think the situation relating to COVID poses a number of um, interesting questions. Um, in my view, the COVID-19 um, pandemic has just been a catalyst for revealing all the excesses and macro imbalances that have been building up in the global economy from the crisis of 2008. Um, we had the first instance then of central banks stepping in very aggressively, um, which has, you know, was obviously there just to save um, the global economy from systemic meltdown, but they also have um, stymied proper price discovery. Um, they've compressed risk premia. They've brought down interest rates. Um, to unprecedented, unprecedented levels. So there's this you know, extraordinary search for yield um, that has made risk take, that has skewed risk taking, if you like. And, and we have a whole new vocabulary sure. that's emerged out of the scenario like you know, Mohammed El Aryan's notion of a new normal, which everyone uses um, now with abandon. And you know, I was once with him where he said if he had a dollar for every time the term is used, he'd be a very rich man. <clears throat> but I think also we we can think about butterfly effects, how you know somebody eating bats or whatever they're doing in Wuhan, the global economy, that's that's an interesting phenomenon to think about. 
and the extent to which volatility, when it appears, happens in clusters. So, you know, on one hand, we have the pandemic, but then we have you know, geopolitical uh, gyrations. Uh, the border issue with China is, you know, part of this general scenario. Um, so I think one of the questions that might be interesting for all of us to consider is that within the broader ambit of investing, um, there's this notion called non ergo, um, there are ergodic systems and non ergodic system. A non ergodic system is one in which, um, the, um, phenomena associated with one aspect isn't the same as the average of the whole. So is India going to be ergodic? In other words, um, represent, you know, how the whole global economy is going to turn out or is it going to be non ergodic? and have certain things that are particular to, to the Indian case that are either positive or net negative. Will, will it create opportunity sets or will it actually um, be to India's detriment? So that's the key question yeah. um, in our mind. So that's, that's very interesting because we've always in India thought that we're different um, and that we don't necessarily follow um, what, what, the rest of the world is kind of experiencing, but that's a that may be an extreme view. Um, we're bound to be impacted by what's going on around the world as well. But um, you talked about, I think, volatility. You talked about geopolitical risks as well, which are significant. I'm guessing. But uh, I'll I'll kind of um, move to Ravi. Ravi, you've kind of had a interesting, and I'm, I'm sure a perspective from both the US as well as in India, where you both you know kind of um, operate as well. Um, so what are you seeing from your prism, um, Ravi? Kendraji, thank you. So I run a distressed fund and an asset reconstruction company. And uh, what we have been thinking about and seeing is, is there going to be interest in the Indian NPL markets or the distressed markets or broader markets in general with the opportunity set that's there currently in America and, and Europe? And uh, anecdotally, we are also seeing that most of the banks in India have uh, large amounts of their loan book under moratorium. So what's going to happen once the moratorium is lifted? What will their NPL book look like after that? So pre-COVID, we had about $150 billion in, in non-performing loans. Our own estimate is that number could go up by $100 billion. So you have 250 billion of non-performing loans at the end of this year or whenever moratorium is lifted. And the total amount of uh, capital that is there in the ARCs is about $10 billion. And even if you add in all the foreign you know, funds, et cetera, that play in India, that may be another five to 10. Right. So we, there is a lot of capital that was required and there was some interest coming in from the transactions that have taken place in India. But, um, um, in our own ARC, we have seen two broken trades that were committed to and done in March, but could not close because of COVID. And the other side, which is the ARC puts up 15% and the 85% comes from a global fund. We have seen two multi-billion dollar funds renege on their part. Mm -hmm. So, which is quite interesting, although they have not said no, but they are saying they're not interested at the moment and they want to delay the closing. So if this continues, clearly the signal is that um, the uh, the hurt in the uh, um, there will be no there will be fewer bids and the pricing of these the market clearing price will go lower. So that's you know what keeps me up at night about these things and obviously safety of my team and everybody and and uh, what's going on in you know in Mumbai and Delhi and other metros uh, is pretty tragic. So. <clears throat> Thank you, Ravi. We'll come back and try and see if, if you can understand uh, from your prism what opportunities you see uh, going forward in the distressed asset space, because that's most people reckon is going to be a fairly large opportunity um, in all likelihood. But we'll try and hear your perspective. I'll, I'll go to uh, Neeraj um, Bharatwaj. Uh, Neeraj, welcome. Uh, we wanted some introductory comments in terms of how you're seeing uh, the private equity landscape in India change in this past few months, really, of turmoil. Thank you, and apologies for joining late. I, despite best efforts, still, still face technical issues at the last minute. No uh, just a, a, I guess, background on myself, I uh, head up the Carlyle franchise in India, which is focused on private equity. 
and Cardell as an institution manages about 200 billion out of which half is private equity and we have uh, private equity funds across the different geos, uh, US, Europe and Asia. And we're investing in India out of a six and a half billion dollar uh, Asia fund. I guess my lens will be slightly different because private equity is a very micro business. You're looking at performance of companies, obviously keeping in mind uh, the overall macro context in India as well as globally. I think for private equity, it's a great time to invest in India right now. Uh, so I think the reason I say that is uh, we're long term capital. So we are suited for environments where there's short term volatility, uh, but long term growth. If you if people disagree on whether the long term opportunity in India exists or not, I think that's a separate discussion altogether. But if you buy the long term growth opportunity in India, uh, then short term volatility is actually helpful. Uh, I think secondly, if you look at the numbers, India's private equity percentage uh, as a percentage of GDP is one sixth to one seventh on a percentage basis that of the U.S. Uh, you know, the, the argument or the growth rates projected for Indian GDP is negative three and a half, four percent this year and eight percent the following year, which I don't buy. I think the, 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 the decline will be much more steep uh, and I think the growth, the, the recovery will be a lot uh, uh, slower than people anticipating, but I don't disagree with the long-term macro trends in India. Uh, so stepping back, when we look at it from that lens, it's a bit of a, I've been doing private equity for 20 years. It's a dichotomy dichotomy of emotions one is facing, right? Your portfolio companies are obviously hurting. Uh, I've never seen a decline a steep where you go to zero revenues overnight <laughs> and it's, you know, your cost base doesn't change. It's a very, very, very hard environment to manage in. And at the same time, there's the excitement of new opportunities. Uh, so you actually have to have a bit of a Jekyll and Hyde mindset in how you deal with this, right. which uh, and we've been aggressive. We closed one deal post COVID uh, and we're looking at a few more. But there's obviously the primary uh, primary uh, and number one uh, in initiative is making sure your portfolio companies are safe uh, uh, and, and the workers are healthy. And then secondly, focusing on liquidity situations in these portfolio companies they're all good companies, but they could get, you know, when you go to zero revenue, no one no one actually does that in scenario planning. And I've done more scenario analysis in the last three months than I've done in my <laughs> prior 20 years, even including being a consultant. Uh, I think on the new investment side, you know, we're finding, and we can talk more about it later, but finding investment opportunities which never existed before in India, right? So when you think about TRA companies in India, they've had access to capital from multiple sources. <laughs> Uh, uh, unheard of, right? And now those companies are raising money uh, either because they're facing stress or they feel they might feel stress in the future. Uh, and then secondly, you're finding many, many more control buyout opportunities, either from promoter companies which have got into stress or multinationals which are letting go of businesses just to create a, a buffer in their balance sheet. So I, I think it's a great time to invest. It just, you, the reality is how much time can you spare from your portfolio companies uh, to find, to, to tackle the new investments coming your way. Interesting that you brought that up. I'm going to kind of move to Sasha as well because I think he'd probably face the same dilemma that how do you kind of support your existing portfolio of investors and also scan the environment for new ones? Sasha, what have you been through in the last few months? So, first of all, good morning and good evening to everyone. Uh, I run K Capital, early stage venture capital business. So, for us, uh, what happened was post March, maybe the middle of March is when we had an annual day. And we realized that uh, things were changing dramatically. I was in touch with a couple of my Chinese friends. And we realized that for us, cash is king. So the complete focus for us for the last two months has been to get the companies to a runway of about 18 to 24 months. And we spent about 90% of our time doing that. About a couple of weeks back, we had an LP call where we said about 70 to 75% of our companies are now having uh, you know, cash for 18 months. But we realized we now need to get it to 24 months. Uh, so we're doing that. We get it to about 80% in the next two weeks is where our goal is to get to about 24 months of cash. And this means really small companies raising like a million dollars and some companies raising $50 million. It really depends on the company. So I'd say we are cautiously optimistic after the two months of turmoil that we've gone through. Uh, where we are is in the ecosystem, not many VC funds are investing right now. And we, we actually feel this is a great time to invest. The challenge being in our business, there's no numbers, right? The companies are really early stage. And how do you meet the founders? How do you go and touch them, feel them, walk with them on the streets and understand where they come from? 
So a lot of my VC friends running very large funds have come to the edge, but they haven't started investing. So as a firm, we decided that we couldn't miss this opportunity because this is, as Neeraj said, a great time to invest. On one side, we have all this pain. But on the other side, we have these opportunities where if you invest in these companies now in downturns, you can't get better entrepreneurs. And so we've actually given our first term sheet about 10 days back. We're still in final due diligence on that company. So we feel that we're confident enough to actually make an investment without meeting a founder. It's the first time I've done that. Time will tell whether it was a foolish decision or not. But we feel that we're now confident to go out and do a few more investments in the next couple of months without meeting founders. So that's my initial take on where we are. We've been over communicating with our entrepreneurs um, and with our LPs because everyone's in a moment of strife. So we're talking about town halls with people, entrepreneurs with 2,000 people or 20 people and so on and so forth. But that is very, very important right now. We're over communicating with the LPs as well, telling them about what's happening in the portfolio, good and bad, which is also very important. People need to know what's going on. And people don't mind getting disturbed right now. They want to know what's going on. We have another LP call next week. It's not even three weeks since the last LP call. That's what we've been doing. We feel like Neeraj said, India is a long-term play, 10, 12 years. And our funds are 12-year funds. So this is, a good, uh, as far as opportunities are concerned, uh, I think every sector is opportunity. Right now, ed tech and health tech have opened up as the big opportunities in the short term. But in our view, we have opportunities across every sector that we invest in right now. So we're spending about maybe 30, 40% of our time on those two categories, but not uh, overlooking the other categories that we should be investing in right now. I think we yeah. might have lost Indrajit along the way. So <laughs> Yeah, maybe. I don't know. Peter, you want to take over? Yeah. Well, um, <laughs> so, uh, Sacha, when you say you invested in um, a company without meeting the founder, what what was the lead time for due diligence? Oh, it, it was, and what kind of company? It was it? actually longer than we normally do. It was more than a month and a half. Yeah. Uh, and mm. so we spent a lot of time on it. We asked many more questions than we normally would have asked. And uh, we finally took the call that we can do it. And the funny thing is, it's the first time we're doing an entrepreneur who's still in college. We normally do entrepreneurs who finished at Harvard or the IITs, the IIMs, or a lot of them are also in their 40s and 50s nowadays. But this is the first time we're doing a 20-year-old kid, not met the entrepreneur. So you can imagine how radical the investment is. And it's our first investment from our new fund to make it even more exciting. So we'll see. So, so is, this, is this because of the lack of opportunities that you feel compelled to no, no, no. move there's, there's plenty of opportunities. We just found the entrepreneur to be high quality okay. and felt that this is a company that we want to partner with for the next 10, 10 years. So we were happy to do it. Hmm. I think the whole challenge was yeah, getting sorry, over sorry. That we're not meeting the founder without physically meeting him or her. And we've taken the plunge. Right. Sorry, uh, I, I, um, I apologize. Um, the network at my end was a little unstable. So, Sasha, uh, I, I'm, I'm done with my answer. Maybe you can proceed with that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, I think we've covered the um, ground. Um, uh, I'd kind of quickly move on to the next part of our discussion, which is to really understand um, um, what you're doing currently. What are your options? What are the new uh, emerging investment um, themes that are, that are coming through? And um, what is it that you reckon, um, uh, because in, in this kind of period of uncertainty and ambiguity, you still, there are still new opportunities that will spring up, right? So what are the leadership calls that each of you um, are kind of taking? And I'll start with you, Sasha, and then we can kind of uh, go to the uh, others as well. Yeah, I was actually just telling the panel that uh, we're looking at ed tech and health tech currently right. as opportunities. Oh. Uh, right. And beyond that, we're looking at other categories as well. In fact, the first investment we, we made is actually not in health tech or ed tech. Right? It's a B2B commerce company. And we're seeing mm -hmm. B2B in India as a huge opportunity going forward. In fact, some of our best companies now are coming from the B2B category in India, which for the longest time was cross-border. So you would fund a company like a SaaS business in India, and then an entrepreneur would move to San Francisco, and you like an analytics company or a SaaS company, cloud company. But now you're for the first time seeing large opportunities venture scale return businesses come out in India with a B2B. And that company is actually a B2B business that we funded as of last week. Right. 
still see series a kind of companies um uh, is that uh, are you able to hear me sasha i couldn't hear clearly so i'm sorry okay sorry uh, no i was talking about the the um, beginning of the funnel as it were series a and seed particularly how is that at a slightly micro level panning out in opportunities for post covid uh, is there any reshuffling of the decks as it were um what are you kind of picking up not really i have been talking to lots of my friends who are in the seed and early venture category a lot of them actually are investing on the other hand some people are saying look we need to meet the founders so it's a bit of a dichotomy so we, you'll see some vc saying okay we've taken the plunge and the rest are just waiting but it's a matter of time because there's about 5 or 6 billion dollars of dry powder available in the venture industry so at some point they're going to start writing the checks it's a matter of time in my opinion right right neeraj i'd come to you because um, you know we were talking about you know the series a seed uh, folks who will in some ways be um, you know uh, the kind kind of portfolio companies that you might at some stage look at what are you seeing specifically at a slightly wider level as far as series b c d is concerned i mean is there enough opportunities kind of springing up and if so where should one be looking you know i uh, i've been investing in india since actively since 2007 and you know for us the deal flow has never been as good as it is today and you know our check size is our minimum check size is 100 to 150 million uh, so we struggle a lot more with uh, uh, sort of smaller checks than we do with larger checks uh, i think the ability and it, i think it's true for other private equity funds as well some people are very handicapped by uh, the portfolio issues they're facing Right. in our particular case and going back to what uh, uh, sasha said earlier we we are lucky in the sense a lot of our portfolio is healthcare and uh, very high quality financial services companies we also have a large china presence so we not that we saw covid coming in india in such a big way we did prepare for covid in making sure the liquidity situation was quite solid in our companies with a 24 month outlook right so we were able to uh, uh, move away from portfolio while it still remains our number one priority Uh, we were able to focus on new investments quite quickly when i think about new investments i think our overarching thought is that growth will be slower and so we're not uh, as maybe previously or prior times in india you felt a keenness to do deals even at high valuations right now you can wait for the deal structure to align uh, uh, to close to what you want right so i think i break it, when i look at sectors i break it out into three categories there are sectors such as pharma and telecom uh, which are more defensive in nature uh, where you know you there is a slight covid impact in terms of workforce not being there for a short time but uh, the the even the near term growth is is significant right so i i put that in this category of defensive sectors there se- sectors such as it services and financials where in it you really need to understand your end customer health right so if you're servicing travel and airlines I, you could be you know god's gift to it in terms of the company you are but you will suffer right and it, as the point was made earlier in financial services it's very hard to get a true sense of npas given the moratorium in place so your diligence has to be quite deep and you know no one is going to take a bet on a risk profile which is slightly skewed i think people will wait you know wait for really a tra company with great distribution and and a balance sheet and then there's sectors such as retail and consumer which without a a deal structure which protects your hotels for example right which protects you from two years being a wash and you still end up making money it's hard to do those kind of deals right so that's the way we've landscaped it uh, while believing that there's great opportunity to invest and this i think will be one of our it will be our the year where we invest the most amount of capital in india most likely uh, mm-hmm. so we're being aggressive but we're being cognizant also of deal structures and sectors uh, uh, you know where, where where it makes sense for us to invest and i think secondly we've reached out to tier a companies high quality management teams right deals as i said earlier which were not accessible to us earlier which we would like to get do, which we would do right now even at valuations which are slightly higher uh, because the history of private equity investing in india has been that people who come in in tier a companies even at high valuations have always made money so you know, people talk about hdfc you people came in at four times book but they still made money right so you have to follow that and likewise the turnaround story in india of people really coming in buying companies at uh, bottom of the barrel valuations and turning them around is still pretty limited interesting neeraj uh, i'll i'll come to um, ravi you uh, help us try and kind of unpack the distressed asset opportunity in india a little more ravi yeah so you know 
when you invest in turnarounds, you need the help of the economy. The economy needs to be turning around and uh, there needs to be growth. So until unless we see that, we cannot really put our dollars behind turnaround companies or manufacturing. So in the meantime, what do you do? So what we are doing is, you know, we, we are looking for opportunities where you are able to model out the cash flows even in a COVID environment. So these it may include things like a toll road where there are annuities coming rather than traffic tolls. These may include, um, like uh, <clears throat> Neeraj mentioned, there are some good companies also raising money. So we are looking at super priority loans, which is a very small amount of the overall capital structure with a, an attractive interest rate. And uh, <clears throat> finally, we just doing what we call COVID bids, which are so obvious that I don't need to run a spreadsheet. And uh, I guess that's where the, um, that, that's where it gets exciting sometimes if you get lucky. And, um, perhaps, um, you can, you can, you know, make some money out of it. But in general, uh, our, our posture is very defensive. And as I, you know, as I say internally, we are looking for shields rather than swords in our portfolio. Interesting. Um, Peter, I'd come to you. Uh, going from what uh, Ravi was talking about, uh, looking for shields, I, 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 I recall in the initial comments you talked about the whole geopolitical risks as well, and especially the China factor and the whole de decoupling that everyone's been talking about. Uh, how do you kind of view that uh, from your lens? Uh, are there real? Are those opportunities for real? Uh, and will India really be able to make something out of it? Yeah, so I think just taking a step back, the two major questions. Firstly, you know, is this a generational, you know, secular opportunity? You know, India already had um, the NPL situation in the banking sector that's now being exacerbated. So that's a huge opportunity set for people like like Ravi who are focusing on it once there's some visibility to turn around. And then the second question is, you know, what are new opportunities being thrown up by the COVID situation? Um, and obviously, you know, supply chain disruption is potentially one of them. Um, so with regard to the latter, obviously there's some question mark around time frame. Uh, right. um, in the short, we, as human beings, this year as one of the cognitive biases that um, behavioral economics um, puts out there, we tend to uh, overestimate our ability to make change in the short term and underestimate in the long term. So chances are, you know, in the short term, the, the notion of some, you know, pivot to India with supply chains is not going to happen um, immediately, but over a longer time horizon, it does seem like um, it, it represents some form of opportunity for India. Um, I also sit on the board of an FMCG company, and it's been interesting that counterintuitively, um, D to C absolutely exploded um, mm. during the COVID situation, right. um, which has uncovered uh, you know an opportunity nobody thought would even be material, um, and that's and it's got real legs because the ability to disintermediate aspects of the supply chain and um, improve you know the the uh, efficiency of logistics is is pretty significant for a company so um so it's these kinds of things that are that are interesting to think about you know what what phenomena is covid going to accelerate um in terms of development what what kinds of leapfrog effects are we going to see i think sasha was alluding to that earlier and also near in, in some measure and of course ravi is very well placed you know being in the distressed space which probably is one of the most bullish areas in India right now. Absolutely. Prakash, I'd, I'll kind of build on, um, you know, uh, the conversation that we started uh, around the role of sovereign wealth funds. I'll, I'll um, Because you have a good perspective sitting out of uh, Washington in terms of uh, fund flows into India and funds that are trying to access the global pool, really. Uh, where does India really stack up um, in the the whole committee of emerging markets uh, from a sovereign wealth fund perspective and 
maybe other investment classes as well uh, what what's your take you know, so obviously i'm i'm very lucky to be connected to india for my whole life and then for the last 25 years in in my work I, i'm reminded uh, i'll start on a down note but i'm reminded of what henry kissinger said about india uh, they asked him when he was secretary of state and national security advisor 40 years ago or whatever it was what do you think of india mr kissinger dr kissinger and he said look india uh, i'm not sure india is the most important country in the world but i'm sure that india is the most self important country <laughs> so, uh, so <laughs> there is some baggage that uh, uh, unfortunately i think we uh, we as indians uh, carry uh, mm-hmm. the, the, india uh, ha- has uh, understand uh, where its place should be as far as worldwide investment and worldwide capital markets uh, and those notions given that india is a complicated country given that india still has the challenges of land reform and labor reform notwithstanding all of the strides that have been made uh, there's still a ways to go in terms of capital finding india in the way that we all hope it will at, at the same time uh, as many of the folks here on the call can attest since 2005 in particular i i'm so shocked at how many india funds we've helped raise how much money has found india how many exits have been realized in the context of india how much is actually now going on so the news e- even in the middle of this crisis fr- from my perspective is is pretty good and i think the the more bullish news for india overall is that there's probably two or three issues on which there's bipartisan agreement here in the us we don't have uh, anybody watching our news can tell you there's not a lot of bipartisan agreement here right now but when it comes to china and when it comes to big tech there is bipartisan agreement right now that there is risk to america because of china and because of the consolidation of power in big tech and the natural beneficiary particularly of the first issue is india so the amount of bipartisan support here in washington for strategic and economic connections on an accelerated basis with india is is phenomenal uh obviously look india like the rest of us is has a vir- has this virus to grapple with right now and to see the uh, what is happening in mumbai in particular but other parts of india too but mumbai in particular uh stuns all, all of us and and we know that there is still a lo- long way to go but but all in all i think the election which is coming uh is going to spell a lot of it's going to mean a lot in terms of how our economy is operated from a regulation and redistribution perspective and if you get a biden administration and democrats in the senate and the house you you could see potentially a real slowdown uh in terms of the the last 10 12 years of investment in america uh and then places like india could on a relative basis be even more attractive but i'll leave it to the investors in the crowd indra ji to comment yeah, on that more that's an interesting uh, way of looking at it where you talk you're talking about both regulation as well as redistribution uh, in some ways having its impact on the growth of the american economy and uh, investment funds really chasing a higher rate of return right in new markets like india or or other parts of the world sasha i just wanted to come to you and we kind of move into the last segment which is to try and kind of take a slightly uh, well a long term view is 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 probably a bit of a misnomer but at least one year down the line if we were to look into the crystal ball what are we likely to see what's the best case scenario for you what's the worst case and what are the factors that we ought to be looking at when we kind of uh, unpack what might happen where you're speaking on neck <laughs> the best case would be that uh, most of our companies will survive the next 12 to 18 months right that's the it's survive right now uh, of course some of them are thriving because there are opportunities where 
for example, we have a company called One MD. It's an online pharmacy business. You know, come home and you don't you don't need to get out of the house. So it's scaling really fast. As an example, and we have a company called Wiser. It's a mental health chatbot. Unfortunately, loneliness, mental health is a big issue right now. So those companies are going to thrive even in these markets. But the rest of them just have to survive and get up to speed. We have a marker of February numbers. And the closer you get to the February numbers, at some point, we show that they're back in health along with cash. But post that, there's a huge opportunity. If you look at uh, e-commerce as a category, uh, the data shows that when GDP touches 4,000 is when e-commerce explodes. And India, as you know, is only 2,000. So there's a huge opportunity for categories like e-commerce. We haven't even touched the tip of the iceberg. My father's in the consumer electronics business, uh, makes televisions, washing machines in India. And GDP uh, has to touch about 3,000 for that to explode. And that's a 30-year-old company. So, you know, penetration levels, let's take air conditioners. Uh, there was an AT Kani report that showed that by now we'd be selling 18 million air conditioners in India. Should have been, as per the data. But we only sure. sell 5 million. So you can sure. imagine opportunity just for an old industry like ACs to actually mm -hmm. scale. So yes. I feel there's a huge opportunity. We just have to survive, uh, focus on getting to profitability, and then the rest is, you know, in your own hands. Interesting. I mean, the India story has always been about under penetration and therefore large headroom for growth. Neeraj, I'd like to kind of come to come to you in terms of what your best case, worst case scenario looks like and what are the things that, what are the factors that you think you'd kind of keep your eyes peeled on? Sure. So I think from an aggregate private equity perspective, I think this year, uh, this year being the year ending March 21, I think volumes of new investments will drop significantly by about 50 you know, maybe 50% of the prior year. But I see the following year actually uh, significantly increases, maybe doubling or tripling. So in effect, you know, over, over a two-year period of 50% up. Uh, I think uh, with the appropriate caveats being put in place, I think number one is that, you know, the, the, the COVID situation, uh, beyond a certain point, however good your liquidity position is, you can't manage zero revenues with full cost, right? I don't care who you are, you can't manage that company profile, right? So the, there has to be a time frame where you say, okay, you can survive another six months of a lockdown with, you know, 50% of revenues. But so that scenario has to play out. I think if it's 12 months at 25% revenue, then a lot of the portfolio companies will be in trouble and that will attract a lot of, a lot of attention. So, so, so taking a six month kind of COVID situation, I think the case I outlined is something I believe in. I think secondly, you know, the point which was made earlier, the supply chains will move around, uh, but there's very high employment in all in all countries, right? So you also don't want trade to come to a halt. And what I mean by that, is if you take pharma as an example, right, there were quality issues in China, people move their supply chains to India, but a lot of it is moving back to the U.S. directly, right? Absolutely. And and partly because of where the administration is, if that continues, that will be a significant negative hit on companies on countries such as India, which are dependent on you know IT and pharma, which are global businesses. Neeraj, and thirdly, uh, yeah. Neeraj, I'm just going to um, you know kind of step in because we've got a, couple, a minute and a half left. So I just quickly kind of I'm sorry to butt in, uh, uh, Ravi and Peter. Um, would you like to kind of offer a quick uh, thirty second perspective of how you see this panning out because we've got a minute or so left. So. I'll just say that uh, I'm, 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 I, I think that you got to think about when you have twenty trillion dollars of injection, what will happen to real assets post the vaccine? Got it. And uh, that's something to think about. Yeah. Okay. And my so, point was going Peter? to be also monitoring the monetary and fiscal stimulus levers because I think that you know those are the key drivers, and that's that's the big unknown to think about. Right. Right. Finally, Prakash, uh, we started with you. Uh, any final words? Um, um. No, we're thinking of all of you guys in, in India. Uh, th this is our, our only final thought. Uh, th there's a lot going on in the world, but our, all, all of our attention uh, is turned to, to India also. This, this is it. Right. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I, I um, really you know, thank each one of you for sharing your kind of perspective. It's a, it's obviously a complex, evolving scenario. I don't think anyone would, you know, hazard a set of guesses. But I think um, having listened to the kind of perspective that each one of you have shared, at least we've got some sense of where this is headed and what India can kind of forge in terms of opportunities. Uh, 
and given the kind of shifting signs in the global economy and and particularly in the US uh, so i think we've it's hard to come up with answers but at, at least we've got good questions right thank you so much what's really going on in this space thank you bye thank you thank, thank you. you bye bye thank you